So thanks everyone for joining uh, our 2023 SoccerNet tutorials. So in this tutorial, uh, we will see many, many things about the challenges and the data set. And it will be presented by myself, so Anthony Chopa from the University of Liège, uh, but also by other team uh, leaders who are present today uh, to, uh, to present their own task. So we will split the tutorial in two parts. First part will be one hour around uh, one hour of a presentation from our, our side, uh, where we will just detail uh, all the challenges that we have, the data set, the baselines, how to get started on them. Uh, and then at the end, we will have the q &A. So we can do, uh, I suggest we do that uh, uh, in, um, in for the Q&A, so that you, you, if you have questions, just write them in the chat first, if you think about them and, uh, and uh, you don't want to forget them or you can just ask them after, uh, that's, uh, that's up to you. Uh, but it would be better, I think, if we don't stop the flow, except if there is really like a big, uh, a big misunderstanding or something, then just uh, uh, unmute and just, uh, just uh, tell us. But otherwise, since it's very, it's quite short, uh, we can, uh, I think, uh, squeeze all the, leave the, all the questions at the end, it will be uh, easier for the flow, I guess. All right. So first of all, I hope that you like our new logo. Uh, so this is a very, very new uh, um, logo that we made for SoccerNet. Uh, the old one was a bit, uh, a bit less fun, but uh, now we have a very nice logo. Uh, all right. So what uh, can you expect from this, um, from this uh, tutorial? Well, first of all, as I said, we will have a complete description of all the data, the tasks, and the metrics that we use to evaluate all of the challenges. Uh, we will also have some explanations on the baselines that we use this year, uh, because each year we aim to be the state of the art. So some of the baselines are new when the challenges are new, and some of the baselines are um, from the previous challenge. And I, I've seen that some of you are here in the, in, the, in the Zoom today. So I hope I don't mess up the explanation on your methods. Feel free to intervene. Uh, if not, but um, yeah, so for the new methods, we will also have some code demos uh, that will be done by uh, our new uh, colleague Hassan uh, and also by uh, Vladimir. Um, and also we will give you an update on all of the leaderboards uh, that we uh, are currently at. So usually the, the participants on the challenges from the past two years, we know that they usually keep their results almost up until the end and then submit uh, at the end. But uh, this year we still have, we already have a few, uh, a few methods to present. So uh, a to, to, few results to show you um, that uh, uh, in most tasks, uh, the, the baseline has already been beaten. So that's really nice. Uh, and we hope it will uh, keep on like that. Uh, and finally, as I said, during the last half hour or something, you can even extend it a bit if needed, uh, it will be, uh, question answering time. So whether you have questions about any of the challenge or, um, or how, to, uh, how to start on the challenge or what discuss maybe ideas, um, that would be the time, the time to do that. All right, so first of all, uh, some general information about the challenges this year. So we have seven tasks in total that we split into three challenge themes that I'm gonna develop uh, right after. Uh, and this year we can count on six coordinators for those tasks. So from uh, left to right on the slide, we have uh, Hassan who just uh, joined us uh, this year. He's a master's student at uh, uh, the Université uh, Libre de Bruxelles, which is in Belgium. Um, we have Vladimir that you know from last year from the re-identification challenge that is still with us uh, this year. We have Silvio, of course, me, uh, Florian from EVS Broadcast Equipment, and finally, Shinzu from uh, Baidu Research. So this year we managed to, uh, to uh, take on board four different sponsors. So we have uh, Sport Radar uh, from where Vladimir is also partly from. Uh, we have EVS Broadcast Equipment where Florian is from and Baidu Research. And we have also AN Sports. Uh, in total, they delivered uh, $4,500 of price, which is $5,000 more than last year. So it's growing uh, the price. Uh, hopefully we can, uh, we can even make it grow bigger uh, next year, but it's already a very, very uh, nice price uh, list to have um, that are split among the challenges. And I will explain exactly what the split is and who is the sponsor for each challenge. Um, so as you know, SoccerNet is a, 
is really a project that is all about open source data uh, on soccer videos um, that are uh, taken from multiple sources and uh, open source baseline. So all the code is uh, available. Um, and uh, this is something that we really want to you know, push forward. So try to have people also to release their method at the end. And last year, most of the, um, of the prize winners uh, released, uh, released their code, which is uh, really exciting because it makes the, the research advance uh, so much. So the most important thing is the deadline, uh, which is May 30 uh, at uh, 11.59 PM Pacific time. Um, so this gives you still a bit more than a month uh, to uh, submit uh, everything um, on the servers. So just like last year, we're working with Evale AI, uh, which is an evaluation server online where you just submit your, your uh, predictions for the different tasks and uh, it outputs um, it outputs uh, a score for each uh, for each task. And uh, the goal is obviously to be the best on one of the metrics that we chose. Uh, all the details are uh, about the metrics and everything. We will uh, release them today during the tutorial. So let's uh, take a look a bit at the themes of the challenges this year. So we decided we decided to split them into three teams because now we have seven challenges running at the same time. So it's better to 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 really uh, understand the structure. Uh, Behind, behind that. So the first theme is on broadcast video understanding. And this is where all the broadcast videos, as it says, uh, are, um, are stored. So these are uh, challenges that run on full broadcast videos. So from uh, usually 45 minute videos. And I will detail all the challenges that we have on that side. The second theme is field understanding. So this is related more to camera calibration, uh, just like last year, uh, and uh, more on the image side. And finally, we have player understanding with all the challenges that are more focused around the player or the player behavior or whatever about the player. So in the first theme, as I said, all the data are broadcast videos. So we have the action spotting uh, task, which is the first task that has been running for like it's the third year this year that we're doing this challenge. So it's going again. Um, it's, on five, it's, it's on around 500 uh, broadcasted videos and you have to detect a lot of uh, different actions, but I will detail that uh, right after. Then we have some exciting news about the second challenge, which is ball action spotting, which is basically the same task as action spotting, but for all actions centered around the ball. And there are some more difficulties as I will explain later as well. And finally, we have a new task and challenge that Hassan will present because he's the task organizer on that, uh, which is called dense video captioning. And I'm not gonna spoil for him uh, the explanation on that task. All right, so these are the three uh, tasks about broadcasted videos. And I, I see that I've put the wrong image for dense video captioning, but that's fine. All right, so for the second team, we have a uh, camera calibration, uh, which is the same task as last year, but with new data and annotation. And I will explain uh, what that means uh, when, I, when I will explain that, because unfortunately, Florian could not be with us today, but, uh, but she gave me all information the, uh, to, to give you. And for the Q&A, uh, just write them in the chat and she will answer, uh, she will answer them uh, later via email or, or via Discord, but, uh, depending on where you are uh, located. Uh, so yeah, so for camera calibration, sorry about that, but I will give all the information myself and then for the Q&A, it's better if you write, uh, write the questions and then I would forward them to Florian. Uh, and finally, for the third uh, theme uh, around players, we have, well, uh, like last year, but a bit different, the player tracking task. Um, so last year, if you remember correctly, you had to detect uh, you, you were given the bounding boxes and you had to just associate them through time. But this year it's gonna be a bit different. Uh, we're not gonna give you uh, the bounding boxes. You have to both detect and, and associate. So it's kind of a new task in a way that you are not given the same input, uh, but it's more close to what is exactly done in, uh, in uh, multiple object tracking tasks, right? So for uh, this task, 
I will detail a bit the novelties later. Then uh, we'll have um, the re-identification uh, re task. That is the same as last year. So nothing changes, same data, same task, same metric, same everything. Baseline is the same as the first, uh, 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 is the same one as the last year's winner. And Vladimir will, will tell you a bit about it. But most importantly, we'll tell you about the new challenge, which is, which is the Jersey number recognition challenge. Uh, so again, I'm not gonna spoil for him. He's gonna tell you all about it in a few minutes. All right, so now that you've seen all the tasks, uh, let's take a look at the, the price chart. So not all tasks are, have the same price, uh, but they are either $500 for the winner or $1,000 for uh, the winner. So on that, it's a bit equivalent to what we did last year. So as I said, we have four different sponsors. IN Sports that uh, sponsors the three first um, the three first tasks, which are theme one, uh, theme uh, broadcast video understanding. Then uh, camera calibration is by AVS Broadcast Equipment. Uh, they give a thousand dollar for the camera calibration task, and we have uh, Sports Radar and by the research, research that splits um, equivalently uh, on the last team, so player understanding with tracking that is sponsored by Baidu, and uh, re-ID and jersey number recognition by Sport Trade. So very exciting. Uh, last year, all the prizes were given to the, to, to the winners, and this year we plan to do it even a bit faster uh, because it took a bit of time last year, but uh, this year we'll, we'll have more experience and we know how to do it. Um, all right. So what, can, what do you need to do to actually be able to uh, win one of those points, right? So first of all, anyone can participate in the challenge except the organizers. So since we are organizing the challenge, we have access to the challenge set, it wouldn't be fair, of course, to participate in the challenge. But other than that, anyone is, is invited to participate, uh, either as an individual or as a team. So. Usually, working as a team uh, helps make better, uh, better uh, submissions. But last year, we had still a few people who participated alone and reached very, very high spots. Uh, so for instance, Jonas Steiner on, uh, on everything that is camera calibration, so, which is uh, very impressive. Um, so as I said, either if, even if you're alone, you still have your chances. Your chances. Uh, and if you want to make a team, uh, just uh, contact some of your colleagues, or use the Discord channel to uh, find someone uh, that will, is willing to participate with you. So to be eligible for the prize, we require that each team that wants to be eligible for the prize writes a technical report about the method that they did. So this is to just ensure for us that, we, that you made a method that makes sense uh, and that you did not cheat or find a loophole to just uh, uh, get a higher uh, performance on the challenge set by whatever mean or uh, annotating yourself or anything. So this I will detail just in the next slide uh, what, what the format should be. It's very light technical report, not like the paper or, any, or anything, but it's still uh, very important to us to also be able to understand what you did and to be able to um, make a summary at the end of which methods uh, work well and why, uh, and this is what actually makes the, the research progress, right? When you share uh, afterward what, what, is, uh, what, what made uh, your method uh, be, be good at uh, some task. So if you want to be eligible for the prize, you have to write the technical report and you won't know before uh, that you are uh, the winner. So this, this is a uh, so many of you may submit a technical report and not be the winner, but I will explain you will still get, uh, get something in, in, in return, um, even though you did not win the prize. So also the winning team uh, will be required to make a short presentation of their method. So this can be in two different ways. So since uh, the, 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 the workshop results will the, 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 present, the challenge results will be presented at a workshop at CVPR. If you are already there, then maybe we can try to arrange to have you directly present your, your method. Or uh, if you cannot be there or 
like uh, did not plan to go there, that's not a problem. You can just make a short video. We will tell you the exact time, depending on the time that we have uh, for the whole presentation uh, during the workshop. But basically, this will help you to um, uh, this. This will uh, make make your work shown to the world uh, and uh, and get some reward out of it. So yeah. Um, about the technical report, so you have to submit it one week. Uh, after the end of the the end of the submissions, so on June six, uh, at the same time as before, and you need to send it to our new uh, email address. Uh, so the old one is still is still uh, open, but uh, we would prefer if you use the the, the new one, which is soccernet at uh, uliage .be. Uh, and we will send you all uh, receive notice once we receive your technical report so that if you don't receive this uh, this notice then it may be that your email got lost for some reason uh, so so just uh, ping us on whatever other social media or or discord or anything uh, or on our own email address uh, with the with the same technical report and we will get back to you um, so the technical report needs to be very short uh, so usually uh, for the challenge, it's around two pages. Some challenges uh, allow more. You can just check it on, on GitHub. Uh, but uh, it's usually two pages, and it uh, should follow the CVPR templates that it just so that it's double column basically. And uh, it doesn't have to be uh, double blind or anything. It's just uh, you can put your name, of course. Uh, but it's just for us. It's just uh, gonna stay internal. We're not gonna publish it, so it's not gonna spoil. Uh, another opportunity to just submit it to another conference or something. So don't don't worry about that. You can still publish publish your your method uh, somewhere else. Uh, we will review uh, all these technical reports uh, and uh, keep it secret. Uh, keep keep them secret among us. Just try to get out of it uh, the, um, the 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 tricks that made it work uh, well, so that we can make a bit of a summary of the whole challenge. Um, so we inside the technical report, we don't ask you to write an introduction, a related work, a conclusion, or anything. It's not a paper. Uh, it's just focused on the methodology. Uh, so just explain in the most straightforward way uh, your uh, the way you produce those results. And basically, it should be enough to reproduce them if we re-implemented them ourselves. Uh, this is uh, just the, the requirement. Uh, so give some details about how you load the data, if you did some pre-processing, uh, fancy pre-processing, um, describe your model architecture, uh, the way you train the model, and, and so on. Um, so we don't require you to send uh, a code, per se, but we encourage it. So if you send a code, we will try it uh, on our end, on our end, and if it works, uh, basically, it's, it's good to be eligible for the price and for the smokes price. Um, so yeah, that's about it for uh, the technical report. Um, don't don't worry too much about the format uh, or anything. The, the thing that we want is really the description of the methodology and that's the most important part. So as I said, we will uh, present the results at the CV Sports Workshop, which is a workshop that has been running for nine years already uh, that is organized uh, by uh, Ricker Gad uh, from Alborg University. Uh, and uh, it's a very good workshop on everything that is related to computer vision in sports. So if you don't know it already, I would highly recommend to, uh, to, to have a look at uh, previous, uh, previous papers that were submitted there and everything. Um, I've been participating in this workshop for the past uh, five years already. And I really enjoy the community that is there. And so we go in there every, every year. And uh, now we uh, were very fortunate to have uh, our SoccerNet challenge as a guest task of uh, this, uh, this workshop. So it will be on June 19 in Vancouver in Canada. So if you're planning already to go to CVPR, just uh, come, and, uh, come and say hi. Uh, it's always a pleasure to, to meet uh, the, the participants of the SoccerNet challenges. Um, so just a bit of uh, self-promotion before we go on. So this year we have three papers that got accepted to, uh, to this workshop. So the first one is related to uh, the task number three, so dense video captioning. We wrote a paper that, is descri that describes all 
of the all of the data, uh, the baseline that we put in place, uh, and uh, the metric for the challenge. So if you are interested in dense video captioning, you can already have a look at this paper if you haven't uh, done so already. Uh, this uh, this paper describes it all basically, and we will we have a uh, an oral presentation at uh, at CV Sports on this paper, so you will get a chance to 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 know a bit more about that. Uh, the second paper that we have is a paper about multi-view. It's also on Socknet, so we we got some um, some trick to get some uh, multi-view feed from a single broadcast view. So you can read the paper for that, and we made a video assistant referee system. Uh, so. It's equivalent to the VAR system, but automatic, uh, basically. So instead of having a, a referee, an actual referee, it gives or automatically what kind of foul it is, uh, if the foul deserves a yellow card or not, or something. So it's a very cool project with uh, Jan Held, who is also a new, uh, a new colleague on Soccernet. And the third paper is a paper that we did uh, in collaboration with FIFA. Uh, and uh, Curtin University and the University of Sydney in, uh, in Australia. Uh, it's a paper about active learning for action spotting. So if you're planning to annotate, I know that I've had a lot of questions on Discord recently about that, annotating new data. Uh, check out this paper. Uh, basically, it, it, uh, it allows you to uh, reach the same performance uh, with less data annotated. So if you're planning to annotate a lot of data, uh, just check out this paper. We have we have shown that for SoccerNet, for instance, we can get the same performance as uh, um, for for some baseline uh, with uh, 2.5 times less data. So which can which is also 2.5 times less uh, money that you have to spend to annotate the data, right? So uh, very cool paper if you are interested in in um, in annotating a data set. Um, but all of these will be uh, will have their own video on our YouTube channel, which is called Akat Research. Uh, so you can follow us there, and uh, they will be released between around June and August. Uh, these three videos. So uh, let's make a summary, quick summary of uh, what you and uh, and and us uh, need to do. Uh, so from now until the end of May, it's your job to make submissions on the FIAI servers. Uh, until the deadline. Once the deadline is, uh, is, is over, you have to write a technical report to be eligible for the prize. Uh, and uh, on June 6, we collect all of the technical reports. We read them, uh, we verify the results, we run the code if you, uh, if you provided some code, uh, and we will announce to the winners that they won uh, on June 10. Um, so you will be notified uh, before that you won because you have to prepare a presentation, right? So you will have around one week to prepare the presentation. Uh, and in the meantime, we will prepare the workshop on our, on our side. And then on June 19, as I said, uh, we will have our session of SoccerNet at the CV Sports Workshop where we will announce publicly the results to everyone and where the winners will present also a bit of their presentation, either remotely um, through a video, pre-recorded video, or live if they're there. Uh, and so the, the, the whole conference is from June 19 to June 22. So if you're attending CVPR, as I said, uh, come, come say hi, just reach out and, and we can have a drink out, outside the conference as well. So as I said, the little surprise, uh, which is not that much of a surprise because we did that last year as well, but um, we still wanted to um, to uh, to give something to the people who uh, present the technical report because we know it takes time to, to to write the technical report and for all the technical reports that are let's say accepted which means that yeah basically there's no cheating or anything in, inside um, we will ask the, um, all of the authors if they are willing to participate in a global paper uh, which is a big summary of all the methods that uh, were uh, presented during the, the, the challenge. Um, so this is something that is done also in other conferences or other challenges. Uh, basically, it's a, it's a paper that summarizes the task, the metric, and uh, gives out uh, one paragraph per 
participants where they can explain their method, their, their name and everything on the paper. So last year we published it at uh, MM Sports, which is uh, also a very nice workshop um, at the AC ACMM conference. And um, we had 94 authors last year. So maybe we can beat that this year and reach uh, above a, a hundred, that would be nice. Uh, but uh, yeah, so we're planning to do that again. Um, so as I said, you need to submit a technical report so that we can actually check that you did not cheat or anything. Um, and, uh, and afterward, we will ask you if you're willing to participate. And if you're willing to participate, you will just need to submit one paragraph summary of the method. You can check the, the paper from last year uh, if you are uh, if you are just just to see a bit the format uh, that, that we're asking for, we're going to go for the, the same kind of format uh, this year again. And so just to give you a bit of numbers about uh, last year's challenges. So last year we had six, six tasks, now we have seven. Uh, there were two workshops where we presented, so ActivityNet and CV Sports, but unfortunately ActivityNet uh, definitely stopped uh, its activities uh, at uh, CVPR, but now we're going with the CV Sports full. Uh, so as I said last year, we had a bit around the same amount of money uh, to, for, for the prize, now a bit more. And we have, um, we've had 600, around 600 submissions from 70 different teams. Uh, but what is really interesting is that we, we had new state of the art on all the tasks that we presented. And this is exactly what we need. So we had a lot of, uh, of uh, companies and universities that participated in our challenge and that agreed to be part of the final uh, paper as well. So we're really thankful for that because it really made the research advance. And so you can check out the results. This is the, the link to the paper uh, that I presented just, just before uh, about the challenge results. So feel free to check, to check out uh, um, the, the new state of the art for all those tasks. Um, so now, this year, just a few statistics. Uh, we're really happy because the Discord community has completely exploded. So we have uh, more than twice more members than last year. So if we keep on this exponential, that's perfect. <laughs> but uh, we're already really happy to, to have uh, so many people interested in SoccerNet. So more than 10,000 views related to SoccerNet uh, as well on YouTube. Um, so this includes all these tutorials and everything. Really, really nice. And the interest worldwide has been growing up as well. So our, on our website, we registered more than five, uh, 50,000 visits uh, from 163 countries. And you can see that it's spreading really around the world, uh, which is really nice. So this means that it's not uh, just some part of the world that's working on it, but we really have people from almost every continent uh, working on it, except Antarctica yet. Um, and this year, so as you, have all filled the form. Uh, we wanted to see a bit the interest between the different uh, challenges. Uh, so this was more for us uh, to be uh, to have a global view of what what challenge is more interesting to you. Uh, but uh, yeah, more or less, it's more or less the same. I mean, the the, the gap is not uh, is not that hard uh, that that much between the different challenges, which is also very nice because it means that all task organizer will have a lot of work uh, this year. Um, so yeah, I've already introduced our team to you. So I really want to make just a, a, a small shout out to Hassan uh, and Jan who uh, recently uh, joined us. Uh, so they're really great students uh, with whom we published at CV Sports and uh, now they're part of the, the SoccerNet organizing team. So uh, welcome to them. Um, so this is just a bit of a reminder. I'm not going to spend too much time on, on it. But if you want to get a table of overview of uh, all the challenges, feel free to take a screenshot of that, uh, either now on the replay that will be on YouTube. Uh, but uh, this is just to give you, uh, so that you, you have a, a bit of an overview of everything that we propose in SoCNet and the different tasks and, and the different data. All right. So now we covered the, all the general topics. So we'll now focus on uh, the individual tasks uh, separately. So I will start with the first task and I will go very quickly over it because we uh, already explained it very thoroughly in previous, uh, in previous tutorials. Uh, but the task is to localize when and which soccer action occurs and we call that action spotting. The data is comprising of 500 games, broadcasted games 
for the train validation and test split, where you have the annotation, and 50 segregated uh, challenge split, where you don't have the annotation and you have to make the prediction yourself. The annotation are very simple. It's a timestamp in the video that tells you there is a penalty there, for instance, at this exact frame. Uh, and we have that for a lot of classes, so 17 of them in total. The baseline is uh, the one of the winner last year, which was the best method uh, at that time and still is the best method this year so far. So as I told you, people tend to keep the result until the end and then, and then submit them to the, to the leaderboard. But here, uh, so far, uh, they are unbeaten. Um, so just to give you uh, a bit of uh, how they achieve that. So this is a very short summary. Uh, you can have much more information on the QR, following the QR code, which will take you to their GitHub page where they release the code and everything for you to reproduce the results. And they have two papers on the topic, uh, which are very interesting. So basically what they do is that they have a dense set uh, of uh, anchors uh, that have both two characteristics, uh, a time distance and an action class. And so the idea is really for each uh, frame to predict an action class and the time shift to go to the action. Uh, so this is why it's densely, uh, it's, it's called the densely sampled set of uh, detection anchors. And uh, it was inspired by uh, dense uh, single stage detectors um, it works very well. It uh, provides very precise um, results. So they show that with that, they, they are the, the, the metric that is, um, that is uh, evaluating uh, the, the precise spotting uh, really improves. Uh, and also they did some engineering tricks uh, to, 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 to push even the results forward, like using different uh, features, like the Baidu features uh, that we released publicly last year and the ResNet feature that we released a few years back. Uh, and so using late fusion on, on, on those features uh, really also helped improve the, the performance. Um, yeah. So now for the new task, which is called ball action spotting, we take exactly the same task description. So localizing when and which action uh, occur, but all actions that are related to the ball. And for that, we were provided by uh, Futovision, um, who are a company in France, um, nine broadcast game uh, from the second league of, uh, of uh, England. Um, and they provided those games with the annotations. So of uh, two types of events, the passes and the drive. So pass is when basically a player pushes the ball to give it to another player and drive is when he receives that ball, but keeps it, not pass it directly. So these are the two events uh, that are annotated and they are very different from the, 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 the events in the first task, which is why we split them because here um, they happen much more often, right? So in, in a penalty may never happen during the game, but passes happen all the time. So you have a different dynamic and we wanna see if the methods that are good on the first task are also good on the second task. And also here you can see that instead of 500 games to train on, you only have a few ones, like seven games uh, where you have the annotations and two for, for the challenge. Uh, so the question is, how can we overcome this low amount of data? And what we hope to see, but not mandatory, of course, is can we use, for instance, some pre-training on the uh, uh, on the on the first task and then transfer the knowledge on the second task? Or can we use some semi-supervised learning uh, algorithm? Because you still have the 500 games that are not annotated with the pass and drive, but you can maybe still use them. So this is just a few directions that I'm giving out. You don't have to follow them, of course. Uh, maybe there are some better, uh, but uh, and this is a bit the direction that we want to see. Can we actually predict something meaningful with that low amount of annotated data, knowing that we have also a, a large pool of an annotated data uh, on the site? So the baseline, um, instead of going with the first, uh, the first method of action spotting, we went with the second because the code was available sooner. So this is just a, a question of that. But it's also a very cool method that is very different from the, from the first one. So here they trained an end-to-end -end, uh, model uh, for, um, 
for the task of actions property. So basically, I'm going to just uh, summarize it very quickly, but you have some feature extractor for each frame uh, that may mix some temporal information or not. And then it's passed through a temporal reasoning module that is, can be a GRU, uh, for instance. And this GRU will produce um, some uh, class score for each frame, uh, telling if uh, yes or no, uh, the, um, the frame contains the, the, the event that you want to detect. So this is a very cool method that we've used not only in, in uh, in this task or, or, or on action spotting, but also on, on other projects. Uh, the code is also very, very well done. So I would uh, highly recommend that you check the GitHub. Uh, I've given you the QR code uh, right above and you have the paper reference uh, below so you can find it. It's also a very cool paper to read. Um, so yeah, so for uh, the leaderboard of this task, um, we have a lot of submissions already actually. But mostly on this on the test set because you know that on the test set you can uh, try a lot. Uh, you don't have a, a hard limit. But on the challenge set we have a bit less uh, right now because there's this time uh, this limit per month and that you uh, cannot put too much uh, predictions. So very interestingly, we already have a lot of teams that actually beat our baseline. What the baseline from uh, James Hong, um, and this is very interesting. So I don't know exactly what they did yet. I hope that they will all submit a technical report because I'm very interested in uh, in knowing uh, how uh, that is uh, that how how they did that. But it's very very impressive already on the test set and on the challenge set where they don't have the annotations. Uh, it follows a similar trend, so which which uh, makes us believe that uh, yeah, it could be that uh, uh, these methods uh, did not cheat uh, and. Uh, so as I said, like the best method right now is around 81, 82%. It changes very quickly because there is a lot of submissions on this, uh, on this uh, also. Uh, but um, yeah, right now it's around that. So you can uh, already check if you are around that on the challenge set or not, and uh, you will have an idea. All right, so that was a lot of talking from my side. Now I'm gonna leave the floor to Hassan who will uh, present uh, the dense video captioning task, and then we'll... Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Hassan al a student uh, at University Libre de Bruxelles. I'm the coordinator of the, this new task, the dense video captioning. So what is the purpose of, of this task? Well, the goal is to generate caption that describes soccer action and local, uh, localize each caption by a single timestamp. For instance, here, uh, it was uh, a goal done uh, during a famous match and um, it describes several uh, soccer actions. For instance, uh, a cross over another player that, that then uh, puts the ball into the end and, and goes. So for this task, we have um, <clears throat> 471 broadcast games um, uh, that are annotated with the with caption. We, those captions are extracted from uh, online uh, online uh, websites, uh, and we have gathered uh, thirty uh, more than thirty uh, six thousand uh, captions. So each uh, each caption have um, is anonymized in order uh, to uh, ease the, the this challenge, because at the moment uh, it would be very hard uh, to generate caption that. Uh, um, generate the uh, the right name of each player and of course each of these captions are assigned with a single timestamp so you may want to, to know how oh, can we accurately uh, describe the, those fine green actions uh, actually we published a paper um separate caption uh, dense, uh, uh, dense video captioning for soccer broadcast commentaries the GitHub is uh, only uh, already online, and you can uh, go for it uh, here. I will uh, present you after my presentation um, a, a bit tutorial on how to uh, to take uh, on. It. So our our baseline is a two stage approach that use two sub models. A first one, which is a, sub, a spotting sub model that will generate 
uh, temporal anchors for each caption. And then we have another uh, submodel, a captioning submodel, that will take uh, around each uh, temporal um, uh, timestamp uh, uh, a clip centered uh, around it and then generate the caption. Uh, those two submodels work on uh, on frame level features that are um, <coughs> um, proposed by uh, the soccer net repo. So both of them, um, both both of them uh, submodel have an encoder uh, that is, uh, for example, for instance, the Bayou features or the ResNet features, etc. Then each of those two submodels have an aggregator that will aggregate those uh, several uh, uh, frame level uh, features into um, knowledge or uh, uh, context of uh, this clip. And then based, based, on, the, based on this, <coughs> we will have a spotting, uh, a spotting module, which is a classifier that will uh, predict either there is um, an action or not that has a, that need to be uh, described. On the other hand, uh, we may uh, in the captioning submodel we, we will have uh, a captioning module which is composed of uh, LSTM layers, and you will take the output from the aggregator in order to generate those captions. Uh, regarding the metric. <coughs> We adapted the activity net caption metrics for a single anchor dense video captioning because, um, as opposed to activity net ca uh, caption, each uh, of our caption are not um, um, do not have time boundaries but one uh, one single uh, timestamp. So in, for this, uh, we build a thirty second time uh, time window around each cron truth caption and then. We evaluate uh, the language similarity around each cron truth, uh, each and each uh, generated caption that falls within this uh, 30 second tolerance. After that, uh, we average over the video and the data set. <coughs> you can ch check out uh, the activity, activity net uh, caption paper, which is uh, dense captioning events in video. Uh, the metric that we will use in this uh, uh, in this uh, challenge is the the meteor one. Regarding the the leaderboard, there are already one submission. Um, we 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 published uh, a first baseline before uh, we uh, we submitted our, our paper, um, which uh, was uh, already beaten by uh, the, the team, but um, we. Um, we uploaded today the baseline from the uh, from the paper, and we had uh, better results. But we encourage you to to go on and um, and work on it. Uh, the uh, basically the um, at the moment uh, I, I would suggest you to work um, with uh, uh, with uh, either. Uh, heavy features like Baidu or training your your own encoder because these uh, using Baidu features allow us to uh, to gain a lot of uh, performance and also um, uh, I would suggest you uh, to to work with um, an intelligence uh, a relative um, time window context because we in our paper we show that. Um, the spotting and the captioning task is quite different and requires different uh, context. And basically, the captioning needs more context than the the, the spotting one. So maybe um, a transformer-like architecture uh, can can, uh, can perform well. And we also suggest you to look out at different papers that um, uh, that work on. And one one stage approach like uh, recently V2Sec or PDVC, uh, which are quite interesting because um, having two submodels uh, is quite heavy to uh, to train, of course. 
so now I will uh, present you the, the GitHub. It is a uh, SN caption. Um, you, you can find the, the, the code of our baseline here, uh, temporary power pooling. Um, you can follow uh, the readme in order to install uh, the and create the, the setup. Uh, we shared the, the, the weights for uh, for our, uh, baseline uh, model, which are here in um, uh, in uh, Google Drive. You can download it, and then you will need you will have to uh, to extract them and copy them uh, in a folder called uh, uh, models. After that, if you want to uh, to train our model, then you can r run this code, the the, the main uh, the main script. Uh, be aware that uh, you need to specify the soccer net path. Um, it will automatically download uh, all your, the data that are needed. And if you want, for instance, to to, to change the the features, uh, there are several features that are provided by uh, by soccer net. Uh, you can also uh, change the aggregator that we use. Uh, basically, we use uh, the NetVLAD and NetRVLAD uh, aggregators um, uh, that will uh, uh, propose and perform uh, quite well uh, in action uh, in action spotting. Mm. Uh, and you can also uh, play on the training procedure. In our paper, we studied either there is an improvement in order to. Uh, uh, if we uh, train the model, the two sub model from scratch independently, or um, uh, train one and fine tuning on the other one uh, using those um, th those command lines. So basically, uh, I've already uh, launched some experiments so that you can see how uh, it would work. Uh, for instance, if I want to uh, infer the the uh, the um, the results with the, the model uh, that I published. You would run the main script. Uh, here I specify uh, the um, the socket uh, path of uh, uh, the socket path. Then uh, the model, which is uh, the model name. We use the Baidu features, as I said, um, and. Um, in our case, the best model was uh, obtained uh, in training first the captioning as a model and then uh, fine tuning and sharing the weights of the aggregator to the spotting sub model and fine tuning uh, on the spotting task. Uh, so, for this, uh, you can add the first stage, which is the caption, and use pre chain. Um, if you don't want, uh, if you would like to train those two uh, sub models independently, basically you would uh, uh, erase uh, the request. And as I said, if you want to do it uh, only on the inference, you can add the test only parameter and then in which it will run um, all, all the code. Um, so it will run uh, different metrics. Uh, and metrics on uh, this the the captioning uh, captioning task, which means that we will use the um, uh, ground truth uh, timestamp anchored and compare uh, the um, uh, the ground truth caption which uh, with the generated uh, caption with the the the, the good temporal uh, uh, timestamp. It will output you uh, some results. Of course, when we, you will do the dense video captioning uh, part, it's harder because uh, you lose precision recording the, the time. Um, and yeah. Um, it will also evaluate on the spotting. You will have uh, uh, some results. And at the end, um, it will run the evaluation uh, on the Lens video captioning, and for instance, here we, uh, as I said, we what we are focusing is on the mature score. We also provided several metrics. Uh, we also um, implemented the soda metric, uh, which has uh, which is introduced in another paper. Basically, um, it's um, 
an improvement of the activity metric in, our, in the sense that it won't do, it won't um, compute the um, language metrics between every ground, uh, ground truth caption and every predicted uh, generated caption that falls in the time window. Instead, uh, it will try to do the best story out of it, which means that it won't compare with every everything. It will take the best uh the yes the the best caption generated but be aware that uh, it's quite uh time consuming to compute this machine actually uh for instance in, in this case it's about uh, uh 30 minutes so um you can uh activate it or or not uh for this um, you can find it uh in the codes uh, if you want to activate it during the at the end of, of the training, um, at the end you you have evaluate uh, lens video captioning. You can include or not the soda metric. If you just want to, if you just want to um, uh, to compute it uh, at the evaluation, we provide another script which is in the evaluation folder the evaluate then uh, then video caption and again if you want to um, to <coughs> use or not the include the, the the soda you can switch the uh, you can switch it uh, in the command line um, so what is the the output uh, of uh, of our, of the model? What what, what uh, are we expecting expecting uh, as a uh, as a submission? Is for each um, a, it is a, a JSON file. It, it should be a zip with all the all the JSON file for each game and with within each JSON file. Um, you need to have uh, a list with all of the commentaries, so is the the commentary that is generated, and also uh, the the time the timestamp. Uh, thank you very much. I, I hope I wasn't too long. If you have uh, any question, I will uh, I will take it uh, uh, after. Uh, thank you very much for for your attention. All right. Thanks, Hassan. Uh, no, no, that was perfect. Uh, not too long. Uh, just, uh, just the right amount of information that was needed for this new task. Um, nice. So, yeah, if you if you want to go back uh, the, to to the all the information that Hassan gave, uh, the recording will be available on YouTube uh, after the session, uh, just uh, either today or tomorrow. Uh, so, don't worry. You can uh, you can uh, rewatch that. Um, so I will keep on with the camera calibration task. Um, so this task is exactly the same as last year in terms of um, the in terms of the task description. So it's still to estimate the pinhole camera parameters. So you can see, uh, for instance, the pan degree, the tilt degree, or or anything from an image that we give. So we have uh, data for more than um, twenty thousand uh, images that are annotated with all uh, polylines. So this means that we have all, uh, all the soccer field lines that are annotated and also the, the circles around. So Florian is uh, the coordinator on this task. So as I said, she could not join today, unfortunately, uh, but I will give you the detail for her. So um, there are still a bit of novelties in this, uh, in this task. First of all, is that we put a bit more images than last year. So we re-annotated some images um, and we gave some extra metadata about the images of the data set. So this includes uh, the game. So from which game does this image come from? And also the timestamp within the, within the video. So this is very interesting because it, it opens the possibility to exploit also the temporal consistency for some of the views that were a bit ambiguous uh, without having um, the temporal context. So here, we encourage you to use that information. You're not forced to use it, but you can. Uh, this is information that is uh, made available to you. So 
if you go back to the video, you can maybe try to uh, make a method that is more temporally consistent and that may also improve on, on some noisy images. And also we annotated some extra pitch markings. So instead of having two, um, two points per line, well, we now have a bit more, um, but I will show you in the evaluation. But what's mostly important is that the challenge sheet has also been updated. So download it again uh, to get the latest version or otherwise you may have uh, some missing, uh, missing uh, images uh, in your data set if you use the one from last year. So make sure to, to, to download this new uh, challenge set. Um, so uh, just like last year, uh, since what we provide is images with annotated polylines, we cannot directly uh, compare with ground truth camera parameters. And this is very hard to do if you don't have synthetic data or if you don't have access to the camera that captured that image, which is our case. Uh, so what we do is the, an indirect uh, quality estimation of the camera parameters uh, that are predicted by you um, by leveraging a reprojection error. So what that means is that we will use the camera parameters to project back uh, the template of the field into, uh, into the image plane, and then we will evaluate how close uh, each line is compared to the template line. So you can see on the bottom part of, of the image here uh, that you have uh, the annotated points uh, that form a line, right? And then you have the projected uh, line from uh, your model camera parameters, which are some uh, evenly, spaced, um, evenly spaced points. And then we will compare each of these points to the line to see if they are close or not. And so we use what we call the accuracy at five. So all the details are um, available uh, on the GitHub repo of the challenge. But basically it means that each point is within uh, five, um, five pixel of uh, the, the correct polyline. Uh, if that's the case, it's considered as true positive, otherwise as a false positive and, and, and so on. And then we can compute an accuracy. And we have also a completeness score because not all images uh, are easy to, um, to, to calibrate. And so if you don't wanna provide for some of the images, you can just not provide them, but then it will decrease this completeness score, which is then multiplied by the accuracy. So there is a trade-off to find between having a good accuracy, uh, but also a high number of uh, predicted camera parameters. And we combine the, this metric in a much easier way than last year. So here it's just a multiplication between the two. And this is the metric that we will take into account for the challenge. Um, finally, we have um, this uh, the leaderboard for, for this task. Uh, so right now on the test set, we already have methods that have beaten the baseline, which is very good. Like you can see the gap is, is uh, huge. Uh, and we have also some submissions on the challenge set uh, with a similar trend. So the combined metric is around 0 0.35 to 0 0.4 uh, for most methods, uh, which is a bit lower than the test set for some reason, uh, but we'll see uh, if that uh, gap fills uh, with the uh, with the number of participants, um, but uh, basically already a very uh, encouraging uh, phase. Um, all right, so now for the tracking task. So as I said, it's uh, a task that we already did last year, but that we're doing again this year, but just a bit different. So last year we provided the ground truth bounded boxes for all the images, and then you were just um, you, you just needed to assign them to a unique ID and to track them over time, which was mostly focused on association. And uh, now it's both detection and association. So you can either use some generic detector, try to apply them and then use uh, your, um, your association uh, model from last year and you're fine. Uh, but that maybe won't work that well uh, as we will see. And, uh, but you can also like try to train end-to-end -end your tracker on, on our data or to use other data sets for pre-training and then, and then transfer the knowledge here in soccer. Uh, there are many things that you can do. And now it's really more like a true multiple object tracking task, uh, like the MOT20 challenge or something. You are given just the video sequence and you are asked to, um, 
to, to get all the bounding box, uh, boxes uh, and their corresponding ID. Now, just one difference compared to the, to the other tracking um, challenges is that usually in video surveillance or anything, you just see once the, the, the same person that passes through the image, for instance, and then goes away, for instance, in surveillance. Um, but here it's a bit different. Since the players can go out in and out of the frames multiple times, you have to, um, to, to keep the same ID for them. So you also have some kind of long-term re-identification where the player may be not seen during a few uh, tens of frames and then come back and you still have to remember that it's the same player as before. So it's a bit more challenging uh, in that sense. For the metric, we use the same as last year. I won't go too much into the detail because it's already covered in previous videos, but uh, we will use the HOTA, which was proposed by Jonathan uh, Leuten for multiple object tracking. It's a very good metric that balances both uh, detection accuracy and association accuracy that you can see on, uh, on the left and on the right, so that A and S A. Um, it's a very good metric to, to balance the two. Um, and this is the metric that you will use for the Lido point. So right now, we already have a few submissions on both the test set and the challenge set on Eval AI. Um, we have two methods that already beat the baseline by quite a, quite a large margin. As you can see, like the detection accuracy was really much improved compared to our baseline uh, and uh, also the association accuracy for the top ranking uh, method right now. And you say, as you can see, uh, the second one uh, was really uh, the the second one uh, was really fresh uh, seven minutes ago, but uh, before the presentation. Um, so yeah, so I will leave the floor for the last two tasks to Vladimir. Uh, so Vladimir, uh, the floor is yours. So hi everyone. Uh, I was already here last year for the same tutorial. Um, I'm Vladimir Sommers. I'm working as a computer vision and deep learning engineer at uh, Synergy Sport. Uh, so Synergy Sport is a division of Sport Radar. And uh, I'm currently pursuing a PhD on uh, multi-object tracking and re-identification at UCLUVA in Belgium and ATFL in Switzerland. And so I will introduce uh, those two tasks today. So <clears throat> starting with the, uh, the first one, uh, player re-identification. So, this is a task we already introduced last year. And the goal here is to re-identify a soccer player across multiple camera views, uh, depicting the same action during a soccer game. And then I will introduce the second task. Uh, this is a novel task from this year, the jersey number recognition. So here the, the setup is very simple. You are given a tracklet of a player and you, tr you will try to identify the jersey number of that player. So here is a table of contents. So um, I will first give a brief overview of the prize money of the sponsors. Then um, I will make a separate presentation for the two uh, challenges and the new task. And finally, we will also talk about the leaderboard for these two tasks. So here are the information about the prize money and the sponsor. So both tasks are sponsored by SportRadar. Um, uh, and similar to the other challenges, the deadline is at the end of May. Uh, it will be presented for the CG Sport Workshop at CGPR 23. And um, each challenge uh, will be re rewarded with a $500 uh, prize money. So let's talk about the first challenge, player re-identification. So here I will give a brief introduction of the task. If you're interested in learning more, uh, you still have the video of, uh, tutorial of last year, uh, which is on YouTube and which is far longer. I go much more into the details. So please have a look at that one if you want more information. So as you can see here, uh, the goal of player re-identification re is to um, actually re-identify a player across multiple uh, camera views. So of the same action at the same point in time during the game, uh, the timestamp is the same. The only thing that changes is uh, the camera viewpoint where we, we can see the player. Um, so person re-identification is actually a retrieval task. So as you can see here, um, the setup is quite simple. We are given a 
a query, which is the person of interest. Here it's a yellow goalkeeper. And we try to find that person into a gallery of samples. And so as a result of that retrieval, you can see on the right that we retrieved all the samples that uh, depict the same yellow goalkeeper. And so that retrieval is performed as a ranking task. So we will actually rank all those gallery samples according to their distance to the query, the person of interest. And so, as you can see here, we depict uh, correct matches with a green border and incorrect matches with a red border. And so hopefully, if you have a good re-identification method, you will have all the samples with the green border, so the correct matches at the top of the, on the, of the ranking, so here on the, on the left. So re-identification is a metric learning task. So here is the setup. You are given a sample and uh, passing it through a feature encoder to have an embedding or a feature vector as an output. And so you will try to learn a feature extractor that um, learns actually a useful embedding space, feature space, which we represents on the right uh, as a simplified 2D version. And so hopefully the goal here would be to have all the samples with the same identity that are close to each other in that embedding space and samples with different identities that are far away from each other. And so, as you can see here, hopefully we will have those nice clusters with samples from the same identities or with the same color uh, that are grouped together. Here are some numbers about the SoccerNet 3ID dataset. So uh, the dataset is quite huge, uh, an order of magnitude, uh, uh, bigger than other famous VID data sets, such as Market 1501. Um, one of the big challenge with that data set is uh, that you have a very few numbers of bounding boxes per identity, because actually an identity is a player within uh, a specific action. And so this has an important impact on training and on testing. Um, and if you want to have more information about uh, about that, uh, I suggest you have a look at our README on GitHub. So this is the link to our baseline, um, which is based on the Torch ID framework. Uh, you can quickly run a simple VID model uh, within a few clicks. Uh, so that would be a good starting point. About the leaderboard, so until now we have two teams that are participating in the challenge um, and the baseline results are not yet forced. Um, so we encourage you to keep up the good work and improve your method. And from our experiment, as Anthony said before, uh, most submissions uh, come from the, in the last week of the challenge. So we expect, of course, to have more submissions in the next weeks. So let's move on to the second challenge, uh, the Jersey number recognition challenge. So the goal of the challenge is very simple. You are given as an input uh, tracklet of a player and you have to output its Jersey number. So a tracklet is what you see in the GIFs below. Uh, this is simply a list of successive images of a player. And uh, this Jersey number recognition task is quite challenging because uh, compared to uh, uh, the classic OCR tasks that are famous in the machine learning community, there are a lot of additional uh, challenges to tackle. So first of all, uh, as you can see, the jersey number is only visible in a subset of the images of the tracklet. So uh, only when the player is facing his back to the camera. Um, also, there are some tracklets where you don't see the jersey number at all. And so we have a special output, a placeholder to indicate such tracklet. It's minus one. So if there is a player where the jersey number is not, not visible, you have to output minus one. Um, and finally, uh, there might be so, some occlusion, some so other player in the frame. And uh, you don't have, of course, to uh, mix the two numbers, the one from the occluding player and the one from the real target player. Um, Finally, as you can see, some of the images also have a low quality. So with motion blur, it's quite hard to read the digit. So here is an overview of the submission format. 
So you should submit your prediction as a JSON file that contains a single dictionary. Uh, so the player ID is used as a key and uh, the jersey number as a value. And again, uh, you should use minus one as jersey number to indicate that the jersey number is not visible. Um, and as indicated below, the jersey number recognition dataset is derived from the CircleNet tracking dataset from last year. And so indeed, uh, that jersey number recognition task is closely related to player re-identification and tracking since it can be valuable, uh, valuable source of information to solve this task. And finally, the data set is quite big uh, since there are almost 3,000 uh, trackers. So this is the GitHub repository for challenge. We don't provide a baseline for the challenge. So hopefully some of the best method from this year will serve as baseline for next year, um, but, but still, uh, the data set is quite easy to understand uh, and to, uh, to use, so uh, shouldn't be too difficult for you to start and build uh, quite quickly a uh, first bit. So here's an overview of the leaderboard. Um, as you can see, the accuracy of the two best team is hidden uh, to keep some suspense. Uh, what I can tell you is that the second team is at least 5% uh, behind the first one. Um, so we know that um, there is a third team also that is participating in the challenge, at least one third team, uh, but they haven't uh, released their uh, results yet. So we are waiting for them. So. That's it for these challenges. Uh, see you at the end of the presentation for the Q&A session. Anthony, the floor is yours. OK, thank you very much, uh, Vladimir. Uh, very nice presentation of the new challenge and everything. Uh, thank you for all this great information. Um, thank you. All right, so now we're uh, reaching the end with just a bit of delay. Um, but um, I will quickly uh, just uh, summarize here with this slide all the challenges. Uh, and who are the task coordinators for these challenges? So these are the people that you need to contact uh, if you have any question on this, uh, on one of these challenges. Uh, they are all on the Discord channel, or uh, you can uh, find their email very easily uh, through their paper, um, any of their paper. So feel free to contact uh, them or contact us, and then we will dispatch uh, to, to, to the correct person if you have any question afterwards. Um, so just before we move on to the to, to the Q and A, uh, I just want to give a few answers to uh, some of the frequent questions that we received, uh, so that everyone is on the same page on that. So first of all, is is the best performing method uh, uh, necessarily winning? So yes, of course, uh, but only if the submission is valid. So if they sent a report. Uh, technical report. If, the, if we saw the report and then, oh, okay, yeah, it seems that they're not cheated. Uh, if they did not make multiple accounts, uh, also to uh, have more um, have more um, uh, submissions on the challenge set that they could overfit more. Uh, so we have not yet spotted anything like that in our previous challenges. So I guess everyone is fair play on, on that side, which is which is very cool uh, to see. So yes, if you're on top of the leaderboard at the end and that you sent a correct technical report, of course, you're going to win. Uh, there's no, no choosing uh, on our side uh, on who's going to win. So uh, will we publish the technical reports? As I said, no. Uh, so the reports are just for internal evaluation. Uh, and then you have the choice to tell us uh, not to release any information about your report. Um, so last year, for instance, we had some teams who uh, were just publishing uh, a paper on that. And so they, they specified, uh, could you please not share any information about our reports publicly? And so we did not until, they, uh, um, until the, their paper was released. Uh, so of course you can tell us uh, all of that, but no, we will not publish. Uh, and we um, actually encourage you to publish um, uh, your method if it uh, ranked high in the leaderboards or if it's provided something new, of course. Uh, so. Even if you're not at the top, but you have some novelty, just uh, just um, um, submit your paper to one of the conference, workshop, or journal. Uh, 
there's a, a conference that is really nice, uh, which the deadline for just after the announcement of the results and everything, which is called MM Sports uh, 23 uh, workshop at AC ACMM. So I'm not sure this year where the conference is going to be, but uh, it's a nice conference and a nice workshop to publish every um, every paper related to sports. So really encourage you to, to, to check that. Um, so uh, as Vladimir said, all the leaderboards are now uh, private for the challenge set. So this means that you cannot see the other participants on the challenge set. And this is like last year, uh, we, um, we kept the, keep the leaderboards private just to keep more suspense until the end. Uh, and so that you are, even if you're on the, at the top, you still have this incentive to, um, to, to keep pushing your results up because you don't know if another participant is uh, also pushing his results up. And this usually provides better results at the end. Um, so this is well, also why we do that. But uh, we will keep you updated on the leaderboard just like we did now uh, on the Discord uh, channel. So if you're not there, you can, you can of course, uh, follow. Um, I will put also the link uh, in the description of the YouTube replay uh, for those of you who want to join. Um, so if you cannot attend the session on June 19, um, as I said, you can, if you want, you can provide us a pre-recorded video and that's fine for your presentation. Uh, but we're not sure that the presentation will be recorded. So we will see that with the uh, uh, workshop organizers, if we can uh, record that session in some way. Uh, but anyway, you will still see the results at some point, uh, at least in the, um, in the Soccernet 2023 challenge results paper uh, that we will publish. So you will have the information anyway coming to you. Uh, and we will also put uh, everything on, on Discord uh, in the meantime. Um, last question is, uh, do you need to write a report if you, even though you know that you will not win? Well, first of all, even if you know that there's a better team than you, maybe their uh, performance will be, uh, their results will be uh, disqualified for some reason. So this has not happened yet, but uh, good. I mean, uh, if they don't write a technical report, we cannot make them win. So just submit a technical report. And also, as I said, if you submit a technical report, you can be part of the, of the paper as well. Um, and, and have your name on the paper and write write a paragraph about that on that paper, uh, which is also a good incentive for researchers, let's say. I'm not sure about companies, but at least for researchers, it's a good incentive. So more information is already available on our YouTube channel, uh, as Vladimir said. So all the tutorials from last year for all the non-new uh, challenges, so the information is, is the same. So you can find that uh, there and also um, we will publish uh, this uh, this recording. Um, you can follow us on other social media. Uh, so on Twitter, we just released uh, a new uh, Twitter account called the uh, um, uh, underscore ORG. Um, so this is a whole new, like a few weeks ago, uh, and we will also publish some uh, some uh, information there. So feel free to follow that. Um, so Discord invitation code is uh, is here. And uh, of course, we have our GitHub uh, Soccernet uh, with all um, all the different tasks and all the different baseline. So feel free to go check check there. And we also have this uh, PIP package called the Soccernet uh, with a lot of uh, very uh, very easy to use uh, tools uh, to get started on the different tasks of Soccernet. So now is the time for the Q and A. So um, we can do that in. Uh, in uh, in different ways, um, I, will, I will explain just uh, just later. But if you cannot ask your questions now, uh, just uh, you can ask us on Discord or on the on the new email soccernet at uh that you can uh, that you can use as well. So thank you very much, everyone, for uh, uh, joining today. Uh, we were quite packed uh, actually, so which is very nice. Um, and uh, yeah, now is your time for questions. Thank you.